church. Hey, that was pretty good, but I'm all about some healthy competition. I just want y'all to know that 830 was maybe just a little bit louder. So did y'all know I could hit that note? Little bit. But let's try that one more time. Good morning, Bloom Church. Hey. Man, that was so good. Well, hey, I am so excited that you guys are here. I've got one quick announcement, and then we're going to dive in today. Today is a very special day here at Bloom Church. Today is Life Group Kickoff Sunday. Can somebody get excited in the house today? I am so excited. Pastor Mike always says it. We grow, and life change happens in circles, not in rows. Amen? And I don't think there's ever been a time where community has been more important than right now. So I even hear, I was up there, I was checking out some life groups. Uh, there is a men's golf life group. Come on, somebody. Amen. Amen. Yes. Yes. So uh, what I heard is, did a little bit of reading. Uh, there's going to be like a Devo. Then they're going to share a lesson. I'm not giving it, so it should be a good one. And, uh, and then we'll play around. So, but guys, there are life groups for every single thing. Please go up to the top lobby, check it out, get plugged in. You are not going to regret it. But hey, can we go before the Lord and can we just pray for today's service before we dive in? Let's pray. Dear Jesus, Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come into your house today and worship you. God, I just pray right now for every single person in this room Father, I pray that you open our ears and open our hearts for what you have for us today. Father, make me a vessel. God, speak through me, God, and let the words that you have for us penetrate our heart and bring true change that will impact your kingdom. Jesus, we love you. We praise you. And we are so expectant for the amazing things to come. In Jesus' mighty and powerful name, we pray. And all God's people at the Bloom Church 10 o'clock service set. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Guys, we, uh, we just wrapped up this incredible series called The Emotions of 2020, where we got real, and we got raw, and we got transparent, and we talked about some of the things, some of the emotions that 2020 brought us, right? We talked about fear. We talked about anger. We talked about sadness. We talked about loneliness. Did anyone enjoy that series? Did anyone? No? Two people? Yeah? 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 yeah. But, well, it's kind of funny because as I was thinking about that, I was like, I guess that is a really weird question. Like, hey, did anyone enjoy just kind of reopening those wounds and kind of talking about some of the negative emotions that we felt in 2020? It's a little, a little weird, right? But honestly, with culture the way that it is, with, with the society the way that it is, it's with that kind of honesty, with that kind of transparency, with that kind of authenticity that is going to bring us growth and ultimately bring us closer to God. And you may say right now, you might, you might be hearing this, you might say, Pastor Tyler, that sounds great, but I don't know, like how is, how is talking about my fear or my anxiety or my loneliness, sadness, how is any of that gonna bring me closer to God? And I would say this, because in the society where, where it's all about highlight reels, in the society and culture, when, when facades are actually encouraged, and in the society, when it's all about keeping up with the Joneses or Kardashians, is that what we do now? Is that? Nope. Okay. Yeah. Moving on. <laughs> Tyler, you're killing it. You're two minutes in, and this is great. So, <laughs> but uh, it, it, it's in those society that the emotions that we talk about, these emotions that we just covered in the Emotions of 2020 series, they're viewed as weaknesses. But I'm here to tell you at 1025 in the morning that we serve a God that kind of has a different take on weaknesses. Check out what it says in 2 Corinthians. It says, if I wanted to boast, I'd be no fool in doing so because I would be telling the truth, but I won't do it because I don't want anyone to give me credit beyond what they can see in my life or hear in my message. Even though I've received such wonderful revelations from God, so to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away, but each time he said this, lean in, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. Everybody say weakness. 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 So now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. 
That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults and in the hardships and persecutions and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am made strong. Did you see that? He said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in your weakness. And when we're honest and we can be real and transparent and authentic about what we're going through, about where we're at, what we're dealing with, even if it hurts, even if, it, even if the world looks down on it, even if it's not the cool thing to do, God says, I'm made strong through that. And I feel like what he's really saying is, hey, I can work with that. Right? He's saying, if you give me that, I can work with that. He's like, I don't know about this other stuff. I don't know about the facades. I don't know about the fakeness. I don't know about any of the, the highlight reels. But what I do know is, if you're real with me, if you're transparent with me, I can work with that. So I titled today's message that. I can work with that. And my hope and my prayer today is that when you leave this place, we can look back on all the things that we learned in the Emotions of 2020 series, and we'll be able to be honest with ourselves. We'll be able to be honest with, with God, with, with understanding that we don't have to fake it, right? That's exhausting. No one wants to fake it, right? But through true, re, like, knowing that, that, that we can be honest with God, being authentic with God, God says, I can work with that. I can work through your weakness. I can make you strong through your weakness. And one of my favorite stories in the Bible is, uh, is actually, it's found in Judges. We're gonna be spending a lot of our time there today. It's the story of Gideon. And if you didn't know this story and I told you the amazing things that Gideon did, you would never guess that he dealt with weakness. But Gideon is a prime example of God saying, you know what, I can work with that. And so we're going to be reading today out of Judges chapter 6. If you have your Bibles, you can take them out. And uh, to just let you know where we're picking up, Gideon and his people, the Israelites, they are just now, they were put under the insanely dominating control of the Midianites. And when I say insanely dominating, like, like check this out. Look at what was going on. It says, because of Midian... The people of Israel made for themselves hideouts in the mountains, caves, and forts. When Israel planted its crops, Midian and Amalek, the Easterners, would invade them, camp in their fields, and destroy their crops all the way down to Gaza. They left nothing for them to live on, neither sheep, nor ox, nor donkey. Bringing their cattle in tents, they came in and took over like an invasion of locusts, and their camels, past counting, they marched in and devastated the country. The people of Israel, reduced to grinding poverty by Midian, cried out to God for help. So these Midianites, I mean, they were dominating control, right? They just sound like big bullies, like, oh, you're going to make that? I'll take it. You know what I'm saying? Big bullies. But one day, Gideon is, uh, is threshing wheat in this wine press. He's threshing wheat for, for food. And the reason that he was doing it in the wine press is the wine press was below ground. And he wanted to do it out of the sight of the Midianites, right? He didn't want them to see because he didn't want them to take the food that he was, that he was preparing, right? So all of a sudden, as he's threshing this wheat, an angel of the Lord appears to him. This is where we pick up. It says, one day the angel of God came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash, the Abiezrite. And I just want you to know, I studied how to say that word probably just as long as I studied this message here, the Abiezrite, all right, whose son Gideon was threshing wheat in the wine press. Out of sight of the Midianites, the angel of God appeared to him and said, God is with you, O mighty warrior. And get this, Gideon replied, with me, my master? Now I want to pause here and I want to point out the first real emotion that Gideon's showing here. Anybody know what it is? With, with me, my master? He's showing doubt, right? God's with me? No. He goes on to say this. He says, if God is with us, then why has all this happened to us? Where are all the miracle wonders our parents and grandparents told us about? Telling us, didn't God deliver us from Egypt? The fact is, God has nothing to do with us. He's turned us over to Midian. Is anybody picking up on another emotion that he's showing here? He's showing anger, right? If God's with us, then why has all this happened? If God's with us, then why am I going through this? If God, where are all these promises, right? He even gets a little snarky at the end and says, Psh, God has nothing to do with us. He's turned us over to Midian. And in other words, he's saying, 
God betrayed us, right? He's, he's angry. But this is what I love. Because remember who Gideon is talking to right now. The angel, right? The angel of the Lord came and is talking. But listen to what happens next. God steps in and he says, then the Lord turned to him. Everybody said the Lord turned to him. The Lord turned to him and said, go with the strength you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I'm sending you. So God sees Gideon in his authenticity. God sees he's dealing with doubt. He's dealing with fear. He's dealing with anger, all this stuff. And it's almost like a WWE match because he's like, angel, tag me in. And he says, I, I, go with the strength that I have given you, that you have, and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I'm sending you. And what I love about this, what I love about how quick God showed up on the scene is I think this is a perfect example of, if you're taking notes, write this down, authenticity is an expressway to the presence of God. Come on, somebody. Authenticity is an expressway to the presence of God. When we're real, when we're authentic, when we're honest with where we're at, the Lord's right there. Listen to what it says in Psalms. It says, the Lord is close to all who call on him. Yes, to all who call on him in truth. Notice that it says, is close. Establishing this immediate present tense, right? It doesn't say, we'll soon be close. But our God is, is right there when we call out to him in truth. And this is the case that happened with Gideon, right? God heard Gideon in his authenticity and his truth, and he immediately, immediately stepped in saying, hey, I see you, I hear you, and I can work with that. And I just called you to something great. I just gave you the strength in that weakness. I just, I just, and I will be with you. I just need you to trust me. He says, I can work with that. If you surrender these weaknesses to me, I'll give you that strength. I can work with that. And so the story continues, and, and Gideon's still in his doubt. Gideon said to him, he said, me, my master? How and with what could I ever save Israel? Look at me. My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I'm the runt of the litter. And so God said to him, I'll be with you. Believe me, you'll defeat Midian as one man. How many of you guys have ever felt that before, right? You feel God calling you to do something. You feel a stirring in your spirit to, to do something, but you just keep wrestling with it. I, I don't know if I can do this. I, 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 there's no way. I could never. I, I, I'm too weak. It doesn't make sense. And the reality is this is something that's been so heavy on my heart for this year is the reality is you probably can't. Right, but why would you want to? If God's called you to something, I don't know about you, but I would want him backing me in it, right? I could never, I, I don't know if I could do that, but through God you can. With full dependence on God you can. With full dependence on God, you can do the exact same thing that Gideon's doing because get this, get this the same promise that God has made Gideon, he gave to each and every one of us. Listen to what it says in Deuteronomy 31. It says, do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord will personally go ahead of you. He will be with you. He will neither fail you nor abandon you. Don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. The Lord will, I love that it says this, personally go ahead of you. Right, This is a personal promise that we can all stamp on our hearts. No matter what each and every one of us are going through, the Lord will personally go ahead of us to make sure that we are okay, to make sure that we aren't failed, to make sure that we aren't abandoned. God will go ahead of us. He will neither fail us nor abandon us. And so the story of Gideon continues, and, and Gideon puts trust in God. I want you to note that. He actually has to make a conscious decision to say, okay, I might feel weak right now, but you've promised me strength, so I'm going to move forward, right? So Gideon goes and he puts together this army of 32,000 people. It's pretty amazing, right? 32,000 people. The only downside is the Midianite army, the scales were a little, a little tipped here. The Midianites had 135,000 soldiers fighting for him. So it's like, right? A little unfair, but then God tells Gideon something so powerful. God said, you have too large an army with you. Like, God, okay, God, like, hey, let's just, maybe we look over those numbers again, you know, like, hey, do you realize that, like, I'm, I'm Gideon, like, I don't have the 135, I got the, I got the 32, right? But God says, 
you have too large an army with you. And what I want you to see today is what did God say or, or what was said in, in 2 Corinthians? The Lord didn't say my power works best in numbers. The Lord didn't say my power works best in big armies. But what did it say? In 2 Corinthians, it says, it says my power works best in weakness. So I want you to get this today. Gideon did what God told him, and he had to weaken his army. Gideon had to go and weaken his army. And I believe there were two times that the Lord still said, nope, sorry, too many. You got to whittle it down. And so he kept whittling it down and whittling it down. He went from 32,000 soldiers to 300 soldiers to face 135,000 soldiers. Gideon, this man with doubt, this man with anger, this man with fear, with insecurity, with weakness, God saw him for what he was. God saw him, someone that would, would, has the, the wherewithal to, to be authentic, to, to be transparent, to be real with what he is. And through that, God said, you know what? I can work with that. And Gideon ended up defeating the Midianites and bringing 40 years of peace and victory to that land. Listen to me. God saw a person who was real. God saw a person who might have had some struggles, who was dealing with some stuff, but he said, I can work with that. God saw Gideon in hiding and took him from hiding in a wine press to a hero that brought victory to the land, and that promise is the same for each. Is somebody with me in here today? Come on. That promise is the same for each and every one of you in here. Don't try to be something you're not, but understand that God made you you, and get this. That's all he needs you to be. That's all that he's after. My power works best in weakness. Think about if Gideon was inauthentic. Think if Gideon was trying to put on a, a, a fake front or a facade. Think if he was trying to, to have this facade of, you know, <clears throat> I am strong. I can do this. Do you think he ever would have trusted God to do any of the works that he did through that, through that entire process? Probably not, because he would have been believing in himself rather than putting it to God and surrendering it to him. Therefore, the victory never would have happened. And what I think it all boils down to is this. If you're taking notes, write this down. Is that God can't bless who you pretend to be. Come on now. God can't bless who you pretend to be. God's not after that. God's not looking at, at, at who you pretend to be. God's not looking at a facade. God's not looking at a disguise. God doesn't look at, at a tough guy or tough girl attitude. He's not impressed by that, right? Because he doesn't look at the outward appearance. He doesn't look what we project, but look at what he does look at. Look what Jesus said in Luke. He said, then he said to them, you like to appear righteous in public, but God knows your hearts. What this world honors is detestable in the sight of God. What this world wants you to be is detestable in the sight of God. What this world wants you to be, that's not what I want you to be. What this world wants you to be, it's not going to bring the victory that I want for you. And so today, very quickly, we're going to talk about four steps, learning from Gideon's journey on how we can be more authentic and we can be more real with ourselves and with God. Because if we are authentic, here's what I truly believe that our authenticity is going to bring. It's going to bring freedom. It's going to bring healing. And ultimately, it's going to bring victory in the name of Jesus. Does that sound okay with the 10 o'clock service at Bloom Church today? Come on. So the first thing that we need to do, learning from Gideon to be more authentic, is number one, we need to be honest with where we're at. you got to be honest with where you're at. I used to have this friend in high school, and I'm pretty sure every friend group has one of these people in the group. Please don't point fingers. But no matter where he was, if he was like two minutes from where he was supposed to be somewhere, we would call him. We'd be like, dude, where are you? He'd be like, I'm right around the corner. And we wouldn't see him for 20 minutes, right? Like, oh, no, dude, I'm pulling in right now. Like, no, you're not. We eventually caught on, right? And we eventually just said, dude, you are not being honest with where you're at. And it was the most frustrating thing ever, right? Like, dude, where are you? He's like, I'm pulling in. I'm like, dude, I can still hear you brushing your teeth. Like, you're not right around the corner. You're not parking right now. But just be honest with where you're at. And I started thinking about this. And I started thinking about, man, I got frustrated with that, right? Like, that was frustrating to me. 
because I knew where he was. Can you imagine what God feels? God's all-knowing. He knows where we're at. He knows what we're feeling. He knows what we're dealing with. But how many times do we go to him and say, you know, I, mm, I don't need your help with this one. No, I got this one. I got this one. Yeah, I don't need you with this. He knows exactly where we're at. And he's just waiting for you to be honest. I love what it says in Psalms. It says, behold, you delight in truth in the inward being. God delights in the truth when we bring it to him. God delights when truth is what we communicate. God delights when truth is what fills our hearts. Being honest with God, it, it's, it's openly admitting, hey, here's what I'm dealing with. Here's what I'm struggling with. And it's putting aside that fear of man that, that I'm going to be judged for feeling this, that I'm going to be judged for, for feeling this. And it's allowing yourself to be real and be authentic with God. And when we're doing that, he says, that I can work with. That I can work with. Can't work with the fake. I can't work if you don't let me in. But when you're honest with me, that I can work with. And so after we've, we've been honest with ourselves and with God, with where we're at, it's time to take the next step. Number two, it's time to surrender it to God. See, honesty is just the, the first piece of the puzzle, right? But after you're honest with God, after you're honest with how you're feeling, after you're honest with, with figuring out where you're at, it's time to fully surrender it to him. And Gideon had to make the same decision, right? Gideon could, could continue to wallow in his, in his feelings, to, to, to continue to feel that I'm not good enough, to continue to feel that, that, that I can't do this, right? Or he could surrender his weakness to God. He made a, a conscious decision to say, you know what? You have this, and God, through that, made him strong. Listen to what it says in 1 Peter. It says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So humble yourselves under the mighty power of God. And at the right time, he will lift you up in honor. Other translations say he will exalt you. Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. Did you see that today? God opposes the proud. Well, what's pride? Pride is putting on this front that, you know what, I'm doing better than I, than I really am. But I don't want other people to see it. I don't want other people to see my, my, my struggles, my, 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 my feelings. I don't, I don't want other people. I'm, I'm better than that. God opposes the proud, the ones that are, that are too good to be going through anything, the ones that, 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 that put on that front, but he gives grace to the humble. God, God lifts up the humble. And he's saying, hey, give all your worries and cares to me. Give, me. give me your insecurity. Give me your anger. Give me your bitterness. Give me your resentment. I don't know what you walked in here with, but give me the fill in the blank. And I'll take care of it because why? Because he cares about you. He cares about each and every one of you in here. So you got to be honest. You got to trust God enough to, to surrender it to him. And then after you surrender it to him, you got to do number three, which is you got to remind yourself and you got to know who you are through him. I love the story of Gideon, and I love the first exchange that Gideon had. Because you remember he was talking to the angel, right? But do you remember what the angel called him just right off the bat? Let's go back to Judges 6. It says, the angel of God appeared to him and said, God is with you, O mighty warrior. This is when Gideon was still in the wine press. This is when he was still hiding. This is when, when he was still in his weaknesses. This is when he was still dealing with anger. This is when he was still dealing with fear and insecurity and all of that. But the angel called him what he really was. He just didn't know it yet. And he didn't know it because he was giving in to the, the lies of the enemy. He didn't know it because he was giving in to, the, to the, the, the lies of this world. He didn't know it because he allowed himself to give in to what he thought he was really in and not being honest with where he was at because he knew, the angel knew that he was a mighty warrior, but Gideon allowed himself not to believe that. And I feel like in this place today, 
There's some people that need to take that to heart. You are a mighty warrior. You are a mighty warrior. You are a mighty warrior. You just don't know it yet. You're in a battle right now that you don't feel like you can get out of. You're in a battle right now that you might not even want to face because you don't think you have the, the, the oomph to get out of it. You're a mighty warrior. And I want to remind you of the, the beautiful passage that, that clearly describes what God thinks we are, what God thinks of us. Listen to what it says in Ephesians 2. It says, we have become his poetry. Other translations say his masterpiece. A recreated people that will fulfill the destiny he has given to each and every one of you in here. Uh, for, for we are joined to Jesus, the anointed one. Even before we were born, God planned in advance our destiny and the good works we would do to fulfill it. Come on, you are God's poetry. You are God's masterpiece. You are God's beautiful piece of work. And I feel like some of y'all just don't know it. Yes, you need to get excited in this place. And when you're going through something, you need to continue to speak this into your heart. This is what God thinks of you. Don't look at the world saying you're not good enough. Don't look at the world that's saying you're not putting on enough uh, smiles. Don't look at any of that. But look at what God thinks of you and you're, remind yourself what he thinks of you. You are his masterpiece. He's, he's planned for you in advance your destiny and the good works that you would do to fulfill it. You just have to be honest. And willing to surrender it all to him. Through Christ, we can do it. Through Christ, you can, you can defeat whatever enemy you're up against right now. And then after we do all that, it's time for the last point. you got to claim your victory. The last thing you need to do is you need to claim your victory. After Gideon was honest with where he was, after, after Gideon gave his worries to God, after Gideon made that conscious decision to step and say, even though I'm dealing with weaknesses, you said you've given me strength, so I'm going to take that step, Gideon went and did the unthinkable. Gideon went and did the miraculous, and he defeated the Midianite army, 135,000 soldiers with just his 300 but what I want you to get so deep into your spirit today, if you're taking notes, please write this down, is this, is that you got to claim your weakness to claim your victory. you got to claim your weakness to claim your victory. Gideon had to be very real with what he was going through. Gideon had to be very real with what he was feeling, with what, he was, was, with what was going on in his heart. And through that, he claimed that weakness, gave it to God, allowed God to put his strength in it, and that brought the victory. Listen to me. Some of you in here today might feel like you're up against 135 soldiers. Some of you in here today might feel like the, the scale is tipped. Some of you in here today might feel like you just can't win. But remember, God is right there. He's close to all who call on him in truth, saying, you know what? You give that to me, I can work with that. He's already promised you the victory. Listen to what it says in Deuteronomy. It says, for the Lord your God is the one who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to give you a victory. He's already given it to you. I'm going to say that again. For the Lord your God is the one who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to give you a victory. The victory is yours. You just got to claim it. The victory is yours. You just got to say, yep, it's mine. He's promised it. He goes with you to fight for you to give you that victory. You just got to be real enough to be real with him. For some of you in here, you might be hearing this right now. You might say, Pastor Tyler, all this sounds great. But I don't know this Jesus guy like, like you do. Can I tell you, if that's you in here, you just did the first step. You were just honest with yourself. You were just honest with God. But the second step is where this gets real good. Because if that's you in here today, if you say, I don't know Jesus like you do, 
I got a hole in my heart that, that this world can't fill. I got, I got a hole in my heart that needs to be filled, and I've been searching, and I've been looking, and I've been, I've been grasping at things, but nothing can do it. The next step is surrendering to him, remember? The next step after you're honest is you got to give it to him. For some of you in here today, that's your heart. For some of you in here today, that's your life. God, I can't do this anymore. God, I don't want to do this anymore. That addiction, give it to him. That sin struggle that you've got, give it to him. That, that, that bondage that you're dealing with right now, give it to him. That chain that the enemy just has you, just, just held by, give it to him. And see what he does in and through your life. Remember, the victory is yours. You just got to claim it. And so we never want to end a service without giving you the opportunity to do just that. To be honest with yourself. To be honest with God. And to give your heart to him. And so all across this room, if you would, would you just bow your heads? Would you close your eyes? And, and I want you to put your hand over your heart as a symbol of surrender. And repeat this prayer after me. Say, dear Jesus, I believe you died on the cross. And I believe you rose from the grave. I believe that your blood washes away all of my sins. Come be a part of my life. Today, I commit my life to you. I am chosen. I am loved. I am forgiven. And I matter. Holy Spirit, I pray right now for every single person in this room. I pray that, that any shame leave in the name of Jesus, any condemnation leave in the name of Jesus, that chains are breaking right now in the name of Jesus, that sin is leaving right now in the name of Jesus, that bondage is breaking right now in the name of Jesus, that addiction is leaving right now in the name of Jesus, that whatever struggle that the enemy has from him that is not of you is leaving right now in the name of Jesus and your purpose and your design and your, your creation for them, Father, fills them right now and that whole is gone. That void is gone. And they can start walking in the design and in the calling and in the purpose that you created each and every one of them to walk in. With every head still bowed and every eye still closed, if that was you today, if you made that decision for the first time, or maybe you had a relationship with Jesus, but you've, you've strayed away from the path a little bit and you're recommitting your life to Jesus, in just a second, I'm going to ask you to do something really big and really bold. In just a second, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. And I do that for two reasons. Remember, right now, everyone's head's down, everyone's eyes closed. It's just me, you, and God right now. But I want that visual because I want to be praying for you in this new journey of yours. The second reason is this is your moment. This is your time. You were honest with yourself. Now it's your time to surrender it to God. And through this motion of raising your hand, you're making that public declaration that, hey, enemy, you've got no hold on my life. Enemy, you can't do this anymore. You have no place here. Sin, you're done. Weakness, you're done. I'm giving it all to my God who is waiting, arms wide open, waiting for his children to come home. And so if that was you today, be bold, be courageous, be excited about this. And on the count of three, I want you to raise your hand. One, no looking around. Two, be excited. Don't leave this place carrying the same stuff you walked in with. And three, if that was you today, would you raise your hand? 